Hello, hello, hi guys. Um, good evening. Happy Friday. Um, we got a good question. It doesn't in, feel like Friday. So like I Friday. know. I don't know what day it feels like. Um, I guess we've been snowed in. We've told you this every time we've done a video. Oh, we've been snowed in. We're still snowed days. in. We're still snowed in. Um, yeah, so I have no idea what day it is. I think that's really a testament, too, to our qualifications as, uh, like, you know, life coaches and personal growth people and relationship so experts and everything, is that we've been shoved up in this house together for how many days now? And we're both still alive. <laughs> and no injuries to speak of. I think that's a pretty we great thing. We haven't even had really any tiffs or fights or anything. It's no, been very really. blissful and wonderful. So My grandmother marvels at the amount of time that, that Melissa and I spend together and... and uh, that we don't really have fights, you know, what do we do, which I always think is kind of funny. Yeah. Sometimes she'll say to me, like, um, and I think sometimes even when like you're around, it's not about you or at all. She'll just kind of go, uh, uh, or you know, you'll, you'll say, oh, well, let's go to the store or something like that. And I'll say, oh, okay, or I'll say, oh, well, let's go to the store. Um, and my grandmother will just go, God, don't you guys ever do anything apart? I mean, because she, because she's a she's a um, she's very much a, her own person, you know, and she seeks out opportunities to kind of go be by herself. And like she go out to the store alone, and you know, her husband stays home and things. And so she sees us going out together and, and like and all this stuff, and she just says, "Jeez," <laughs> it makes her feel makes her feel sick. I mean, she likes it, but she just imagines if it were her. Oh she my can't gosh! It. I just realized my title. I put how to deal with rude and blame rude people. And blame is what I meant to put. But we had a good question in the GNM uh, self healing support group, which it's it's a funny question. It's a great question. I think it's something that's very much relatable to almost everyone. I didn't, I didn't realize my hair looks so crazy. Look how crazy I need a haircut. Yeah, I mean, she pulled up this thing where she's sharing the videos, and it's like I've got some like wild hair. So please excuse me. I've been snowed in. What do you want me to do? Yeah. Melissa's yeah. actually Melissa's actually offered to give me a little trim because he it's like out of control. It. I feel like you need to have. I feel like you need some kind of qualifications for that. You know what? I have. I had a traumatic experience when I was about nine or ten years old with a family member who got, gave me a haircut, and it was not to my taste, even at that young age. Do you have any idea how bad a haircut has to be for an eight-year-old boy to object to it? You know, and so from then on, I just I don't want to. You know what it is? I value our relationship too much. I don't want. Oh, you don't. Oh, that's, you know, that's pretty good. I don't want to Thank create a situation where I have resentment, <laughs> you know, towards you for 25 years because <laughs> of something awful that happened with your hair. You, you, know? would, you wouldn't hate me for 25 years, maybe 25 minutes. You, you're you're very resilient. You, you'll get over it. With a haircut, I'm a pretty vain person. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, in other news, if you're following my uh, non-shampooing experience, I've been, I haven't used shampoo for like two and a half weeks. Oh, maybe almost three weeks, which is, you know, a record for me. Um, I've never done like long term the no shampoo thing, and it's pretty, pretty good, pretty okay. Today I washed it with uh, baking soda, and then I did your apple cider vinegar technique. Speaking of which, when you said that, I said, "Oh boy, it's Friday. That's <laughs> apple cider vinegar night. That's a Tuesdays and Fridays, the highlights of my week." <laughs> I thought it was Tuesday, Thursday. No, Tuesday, Friday. Tuesday, Thursday. You had to. That's like the best way you can space out two as evenly as possible. Yeah, and so. So yeah, like, and it's been it's been going really well, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the the progression of uh, what keeps happening because your hair looks great. Well, thank you. And you uh, don't use any shampoo at all. I haven't all. used shampoo for like a year or a year and a half or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, I just do the apple cider vinegar. I rinse about every day. I um, use the apple cider vinegar twice a week because I know you're all wondering what what does he do? What for does this he hair? do? For his hair? Yeah, and so that's what I do, and I really look forward to it because when you just rinse it, it's like when you actually get to put something in there. It's kind of an exciting thing. Yeah. You know? so. Another little random decision I decided. I I'm doing a 48 hour social media like fast because I find that I check my phone like I'm hooked on the dopamine of like looking and seeing notifications and, and messages and the bling 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 you know like you're at the slot machine and I'm like I think I need a little bit of a break so I'm taking 48 hours of like not checking my phone and comments and whatever all the posts that you see on my on my page have been pre-scheduled so I'm not cheating, but I'll be back Monday. Jamie says to someone without using a name, I couldn't stop staring at your hair, and so I'm going to assume that's about me. Don't correct me if Don't I'm correct. wrong. Just let me persist in my in my good feeling illusion. Um, so what are we going to talk about today? This is pretty interesting. We had a really good question, right, mm -hmm. in the uh, self-healing support group. Um, we'll kind of, we'll, you know, just do it paragraph by paragraph. Yep. I have a coworker who occasionally gets in in her head, I've done something that she doesn't approve of, and basically when this coworker, you know, 
feels this way, she's very rude and, and mean to the individual, right? So she's, she works with someone who kind of seemingly out of nowhere decides that she's done something inappropriate and then kind of comes down inappropriately hard on her even if she had done something when in fact it seemed like she hadn't done anything. Um, when this happens, it's very, very difficult for me to not get very, very frustrated, right? Probably pretty relatable. I, I know in the past, I know, I know for me, one of the biggest things um, that was difficult for me to deal with was being blamed for something I had not done or being accused of something um, that I that I felt was unjust, being unjustly accused by somebody because some of my early life experiences involved people accusing me of having said something or done something that I knew I did not do and basically using the force of their authority to say, well, too bad, I think you did it. Um, so that's definitely understandable. Um, and then they say, last time it happened after it was resolved, I got a nasty sinus cold, right? It's kind of like a, a this stinks conflict kind of thing. Well, it would uh, well it would seem we're in the midst of it again. So this lady's, you know, she's flaring up. Her rudeness is coming out. Um, and I'm not looking forward to another cold when all this is done. So this is a very good, this is a very intelligent person asking very intelligent questions. There's someone in my environment who behaves in a certain way. And I am responding to that person in ways that I don't want to be responding. And how can you help me to respond differently? Do you see that? That there's, there, there's just kind of, um, and I'm not going to like, you know, lecture, but there is just such a valuable sense of responsibility, obviously, that this person has for their experience. They know that this person shouldn't be the way that they are. They know that they shouldn't be rude and they shouldn't be doing those things, but she's not complaining. She's saying practically and tactically, here's my situation. Here's the fact of the matter. Last time I responded in a way that wasn't maximally resourceful. I want to respond in a way that's more resourceful, but I can't quite figure out what that way is. Do you see all the presuppositions of personal responsibility that exist there? And also, more importantly, the, 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 the assumption of there is something that I haven't figured out that I could be doing here that would allow me to improve what it's like to be me, that would allow me to create a more positive experience of this lady. Um, how do I be chill about this now and avoid dealing with like the healing phase and the cold and the sinus and all this stuff later when she's still very much being, uh, so the lady's still very much a problem and she'd rather, <laughs> this is pretty funny, I'd rather loosen the knob on her chair so that she falls flat on her ass, right? And so that's some real talk there, you know, and sometimes this is how we feel about people. I don't ever feel that way about anyone, of course, because I'm perfect, but I, I, I mean, I do. Um, <laughs> I think that's pretty hilarious. Actually, that actually reminds me of, here's confession time. In fifth grade, one of the nicest kids, it was my one of my really good friends, um, his name was Chris, and his last name, I think it had the, the word Barry in it, but I can't, anyway, probably not relevant. Um, he was my one of my really good friends, super sweet kid, um, and very kind of intelligent, soft-spoken, just kind of, you know, really just a, a rare find in life, let alone in fifth grade. And we were doing some kind of arts and crafts thing where we were kind of cutting construction paper and stuff. And he had stood up and I thought it'd be funny to play a joke on him, like to pull his chair out a little bit so that when he sat down, he'd either almost fall off or miss it. Well, he actually completely fell and he didn't hurt himself, but it was, it was, it turned out to not be funny. Like I thought it was going to be funny and then it wasn't. And then I felt really bad because I thought that, you know, maybe he thought I did it to him on purpose or maybe he thought someone intended for, and so Anyway, I can relate to this whole chair thing. Don't do it, though. It's not worth it. You feel, you feel guilty. Yeah, years later, you remember. You'll have a whole different kind of conflict it. over Chris, that. If Chris, if you're watching this, I'm really sorry. You know what I remember? Just, something. I remember distinctly, he, he gave me a, for Valentine's Day, he gave me a, um, a cheat code for a Star Wars video game that allowed me to fly a special type of spaceship. And I just, I always, I appreciated that guy. so much. Yeah, he was a really cool kid. He didn't deserve that. It was unintentional. So anyway, don't, don't pull chairs out for many people. And from the GNM perspective, the whole thing of a stink conflict, which is really great because next month for March in the Resolve um, program, we're, it's going to be all about stink conflicts and all the different elements and how to kind of what we're doing in a mini version in this video is how do I prevent myself from having a perception that causes me internally, like biologically to say, this stinks. I'm very frustrated. I'm very annoyed. This sucks. Um, this person is rude. I don't want to have to deal with this, um, which biologically causes erosion within your nasal passage and your sinuses uh, during the act of conflict. Then once you resolve it, once you have the confrontation or you let it go or something changes and you resolve it, then you have the restoration, you get the sinus uh, drainage and swelling and sneezing and all of the stuff associated with sinus issues comes from this type of stink conflict. So this is, it's very, it's so useful because one, it just helps you with your interpersonal skills, like dealing with people, which we all have to do. But then also on a health, uh, from the health perspective, like your body, whether or not it's adapting has to do with your perception, with how you're thinking, what you're feeling. You know, it's not a germ. 
that you caught. It's not, you know, you didn't touch the doorknob and then touch your mouth and the germ got on you. That's not how we develop symptoms like a cold. Um, it's due to your um, the, these psychobiological conflicts. And so it's very, very functional to learn how to manage your experience in this way and create a better perception of, you know, the rude and people, people and people that are blaming you in your life experience. It's interesting. I was actually just answering a question fairly similar to this one in a, in a group. And I think the first thing is, here's a, here's a big picture principle. And we'll just start with this one. And if this kind of like grinds your gears a little bit or if it doesn't seem really accessible to you or it sounds like, no, that's bullshit. This lady needs to straighten up and leave this other nice lady alone. We'll, we'll kind of like flesh out some of the details about how you can really practically implement this or get to the point where it's what I call experientially accessible. So that, you know, if you see like a really great cool tool and it's like, you know, way up on a shelf that you can't reach, it's not going to do you that much good. We need something, we need a ladder, we need steps that we can climb up to and access it. And one of the things I found in personal and spiritual growth is how can I get myself to the point that I can access these big picture principles in specific detail situations where it would be useful. Sometimes I think about that thing and I think, oh, F that, this person's out of control. I don't, you know, I shouldn't have to do, how do I get myself to the point where I can make sense out of using all of the skills and all the tools that are available to me? So we will get there. Um, just to start though, here's a very useful principle in dealing with other people and a very useful principle for getting myself to the point of making sense out of doing what serves me. Not what I should do or ought to do or what they deserve for me to do, but doing what serves me and what's going to improve what it's like like to be me. I'm 100% responsible for my experience of you. I am 100% responsible for my experience of you and the way you are at a given moment in time. And we won't go too much into the theory behind that because who cares, but if you just find it and if you can wrap your mind around that and ponder that and consider the possibility, not that that's necessarily absolutely true, but that if you could persuade yourself that it were true, that it would serve you immensely and that it would help you create more of what you want in life and less of what you don't. One of the things that I've noticed is that when I have a complaint about another person, right? It's, it's usually Melissa because we spend <laughs> much of our time here. When I have a complaint about another person, what I'm complaining about, it's not really their behavior. It's not really something that they've done. It's my experience of their behavior. And it's my experience of what they've done. Now, that doesn't mean that shouldn't, that it's wrong to ask someone to change their behavior or if someone's harassing you to, you know, get someone else to intercede. This is not about what you should do. I'm just, these are just realities of consciousness, things that I've noticed in my own personal experience. And I tested this because sometimes you would do something, a particular behavior, you'd make a remark, or you'd be in a certain mood. I mean, take your pick, right? They did something, they didn't do something, the manner in which they went about doing or not doing that thing, um, whatever. They did something, and I had a negative experience of it. And on other occasions, they did the exact same thing, and my experience was not as negative. It wasn't as problematic for me. It wasn't as experientially relevant in a negative sense. If I have an instance of that happening in my life, I have to acknowledge to myself, or it would serve me to acknowledge to myself, there's something going on internally within me that determines something about the quality and the character of what my experience of them is at a given moment in time. One of the things I discovered or decided early on in life was that you know I, I was convinced that the world was full of jerks and idiots and inconsiderate people. And I sort of sat down and I said, okay, I'm not willing to give up that belief yet. I'm not at the place. And I, you, know, you meet yourself where you are. I'm not willing to give up this idea that the world has a lot of dumb people and stupid people and idiots in it. But what I am willing to do is say, all right, if I know that's true, it, the onus is on me to find a way to engineer an experience of those people that's acceptable to me, right? That, that, that that's, it maybe even is positive. Like, you know, maybe is there some sort of experiential Teflon that I could kind of cope myself with to make this not relevant or to make it so that I can create a positive experience of them because I know I've done that in the past. And if I know I've done it in the past, I know it's possible for me to do it. And if it's possible for me to do it and I don't do it, whose responsibility is that? Well, it's mine. So you see, you begin to get to this point where you, you go general. It's something Abraham talks about. It's a very smart thing. Extricate yourself from the specifics of the situation. She said this, she does this, she always, she never, blah, 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 all those different things. These are all the mechanisms of justification. The issue with justification is not that it's wrong. The issue is that we, what we're, ju justification is either unnecessary or unresourceful. If you're enjoying your experience, don't bother justifying it. You don't need to justify it to anyone. If you're not enjoying your experience, your capacity to justify it is irrelevant because it's not worth justifying. Do you see that? Because you don't want to be having it. And that's one of those things I've never felt better about feeling bad because I felt justified in feeling bad. I usually ended up feeling worse because I felt more of those bad feelings because look at me and look at my reasons and I've prepared a report here, Your Honor, and 
and here are my grievances, and this is why you're going to rule in favor of my feeling so bad. And the internal judge always did. So I always start with that basic notion that you know it's my job to create a resourceful experience of my reality, in general and specifically. This lady, this situation, this man, whatever it is that you're dealing with, they're just a subset of your reality. We want to depersonalize this thing because we you get mad. It's almost like a sibling or something. It's like, but she just da 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 da, you know? No. We're trying to improve what it's like to be you. That's all that matters. That's all that matters. They're, they're, they're going to get what's coming to them, and we'll talk about that, whatever that is. And you don't have to bother yourself about that. The issue, though, that we should be concerned about is we're going to get what's coming to us, too. And if I have a habit of justifying a negative or an unresourceful experience of another person, I'm going to get what's coming to me, which is negative and unresourceful experiences of other people and a sensation that those experiences are kind of written stone and unavoidable. And that and I have possibly no it's cold. <laughs> and, and that as well, yeah. <laughs> And so that's the first thing. I am 100% responsible for my experience of other people. And sit down and really persuade yourself that the issue and the, the, the thing that you're upset about is your experience of them and what they're doing. It's not what they're doing. Because if you had just won the lottery, if you just had the best workout of your life, if your kids had just gotten accepted to some wonderful thing they wanted to get accepted to, and you went in and somebody was being a jerk, would you kind of just say, wow. Well, Maybe next time. You know what I'm saying? There'd be a, there'd be, it wouldn't just, it wouldn't stick in quite the same way. Mm. So you have that capacity. And this is one of those things for me is it's my job to be in a state that is too lovely to me to, uh, for, for me to allow myself to be sullied by someone else and what they're doing. If I'm kind of just wearing my regular everyday clothes or like my schlub clothes, like my, you know, my, I don't feel good about these, are just my around the house clothes and somebody, you know, spills something on me, I say, oh, that's okay. I don't really like this anyway. If I'm kind of in a mediocre state, you know, it's oh, it's here we are Friday, 3 p.m., just kind of, dur, 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 and someone comes along and they spill some rudeness or negativity, I'm going to say, oh yeah, I'll go for that. I'll get upset about that. You know, I, I, I will go into kind of the frustration and all of that stuff because, you know, to be honest with you, I wasn't feeling that great anyway. But if you've got that momentum already, if you're already identified with your ideal, there tends to be a different natural response. And so that's another principle, this general idea of keeping myself in such an elevated state that the crap that they throw at me, they don't have the they don't have the force necessary to get the crap to make it all the way up to where I am. Do you know what I'm saying? If someone's throwing crap at me from the street and it's, get, it's hitting me in the face, I need to ascend to a higher balcony. You know, And I found this to be true in my own life. I don't always do it. But when I do do it, it always works because they can only throw it so high. Another thing um, with this I've found with myself is um, this feeling of conditional okayness. And so like if my okayness wasn't already a foregone conclusion before I left the house today, if my like self-esteem and self-confidence and who I felt I was as a person, my value, what I give, like just who I am, um, if I am waiting for approval or okay, you know, or, or good feedback or good responses from people in order to prove that is true to myself, um, that you, you kind of lose before you leave the house because that's where you've got to see, oh, am I am I upset by her rudeness and her blaming me because in some way she holds a little piece of my okayness within her. And so if she holds a little piece of your okayness and she's withholding it from you or instead of giving you okayness, she's throwing not okayness at you, um, that's always going to you know, end up not in your favor. You're always going to end up feeling bad because in some way you are waiting for the approval of someone else to let you know whether or not you're okay. And so, and that stinks, obviously. Like if you, you know, if this person's withholding okayness from you or they're throwing not okayness at you, it's like, oh, that stinks. I really wanted to be okay. I really wanted to not have any conflicts. I really wanted everything to be good. But here you are screwing all of that up for me. But the thing is, is having, if the ball was ever in her court, I mean, you put the ball in her court because it's your buttons, it's your ball, like everything, it belongs to you. And so any ability that she has to affect you is there as a result of what you're saying. You are entirely responsible for her ability to influence you in the way that she has or is. 
and one of the things you said, she owes me uh, my okayness, right? And that's that whole, and that's that thing as I have this kind of elaborate, and this stuff is, is, is everyone to some extent or another probably has a little bit of this going on. And it's not, again, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that there are experiential consequences to having things be this way. I used to just naturally get really upset whenever anyone was upset with me, whether it was legitimate or not. And I got so upset that I spent a lot of time complaining to you and explaining to other people and fighting with them, making my case. And that's what I had to do growing up because I, there was a lot of um, injustice in my house household, at least I experienced it that way. A lot of being blamed for things I didn't do and being punished too much for things that I probably didn't even do it, even if I did, you know, lighten up a little bit. And so I had this kind of visceral response to it. And it was because I set up within my mind this elaborate framework. If I do this, 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 and this, and I don't do that, da, 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 I'm okay. And it, it worked in my household. Is that if I did, da, 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 and I didn't do, da, 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 and it was an impossible thing to get right all of the time, but I could get it right 65% of the time, right? Um, if I got it right, then I was supposed to get my reward, which was not electric shock. It was a little, you know, kibble of okayness or something like this, right? But when I went out into the world, though, not everyone had made that arrangement. You know what I'm saying? Not everyone had the same criteria as, as my stepmother did. And so... Sometimes people were just in a bad mood and they encountered me and took it out on me. And when that was the case, I felt immensely um, wronged because I said, no, wait a minute. I didn't do anything rude. I said, thank you. I did ba da da. I helped you. I did da. I stood back and I didn't say this and I made sure that this and that and all that. And now you're still mad at me. You owe me my okayness, this kind of extrinsic okayness. And I was feeling kind of robbed because, but I didn't see for a long time that I had set up in my kind of worldview, this almost like experiential economy where if I do certain things, then you compensate me with some indication that you think I'm okay, or at least you don't saddle me with some indication that you think that I'm not okay. And so when I kind of learned to kind of settle, set that whole thing aside, I developed an unreasonable ability to create a positive experience of other people, regardless of whether or not they were behaving appropriately. And that's a very useful thing. And I think probably it's a good time to mention, this isn't about how to be a comfortable doormat. You know, that, that's not what this is about. This is about creating a positive experience of what is, which is always the first step to creating what can be. I'm not talking about how to, you know, stuff the crying so that you don't embarrass yourself at work, but you still feel torn up and conflicted inside. I'm talking about transcending the situation. And there are, there are always pretty much two ways that I can approach a given situation. Um, one is, uh, here I am, and here's the level at which I'm currently existing. Here I am, here's my problem. I can go over and I can tinker with the problem and try to solve it. Go talk to HR, have a confrontation with the lady, do all the kind of classic stuff that we learned how to do, you know, at the social level. The option that I tend to prefer though, kind of the option in consciousness, the kind of inner work, like I want to build something new in me, is the transcending the problem. I want to transcend, I don't want to just get rid of her, because that's, that's kind of like, it's all of our default settings to one degree or another. There's a noise out there, I want that noise gone. There's a person, they're behaving a certain way, I want that behavior gone. There's a this, I want that gone. I want this thing here. And we want to rearrange reality. One of the things that I found, though, is that when I begin to do work on my experience of reality, when I begin to say, what is it about my, my the kind of, ecosystem of my experience that's causing that to be a problem? Why am I experiencing this as, as not just like a problem, oh, I'd like to see if we can address this, but like an existential problem, like I'm physically getting sick because I'm so upset about this. And then I go to work changing those things, not for them or not because I should, but because I want to be resilient in that way. I want to be flexible in that way. Right. I, I would like to be able to have, I, I have people, they're not often, but I remember about, gosh, probably been about six months ago or may, no, even longer than that, maybe closer to a year. Somebody sent me a message on Facebook. I, I had no idea who this person was accusing me of all sorts of awful, was I mean, <laughs> ter it was a terrible thing. You're a narcissist. You're rude. You don't care about other people. You're completely devoid of empathy, blah, blah, blah. I mean, it was to the point where I was thinking, is this, are they, do they think I'm someone else? I don't, I, you know, because even if that stuff's true, I certainly don't, you know, treat people that way on social media. That's my thing is I'm willing to say, okay, maybe I am a narcissist, but what specifically makes you think that's true? Um, you know, because I was just, because that, you know, that, that was the thing. I was like, did I go into some group and, met, you know, just like, I mean, you would have thought that I just was cyber bullying somebody like Dr. Phil level, you know, <laughs> like, like, you know, and, and here's Steve who's been trolling this person for three years now and ruined their life. And I got this message and I was sort of, you know, my response, I was sort of taken aback, but I immediately recognized, not immediately, but almost immediately that my job was to find a way to create as positive an experience of this situation as I could. I ended up on the phone with this person. We, 
fleshed it out. There was no, essentially, I mean, I still don't really fully understood what happened, but anyway, we're on good terms now. He doesn't feel that way about me. Um, he became convinced basically that everything that I wrote on my page, I was talking about him, which is kind of funny if you think about it. He thinks I'm a narcissist. Um, and he, he felt like he would post something and then I would post something five minutes later and I had been looking at him. To be honest with you, if I don't know people and they send me a friend request and I see several things from them and I don't really like it, it doesn't edify me. I kind of cure, I curate my consciousness. I do a lot of unfollowing. I had unfollowed this person months before. And so I was like, literally, you have no idea. Not to be uh, dismissive, but I didn't know you existed until you sent me this message, right? Um, that's how far away from mocking or ridiculing you <laughs> this situation is. And, and yet here was a person who completely out of nowhere was convinced that I was doing this thing. And I, in, in, in the, the, and I was a little upset. Remember, I was kind of like, <laughs> Debbie says, I remember when that happened. Yeah, yeah, I remember it too, Debbie. <laughs> I did a video about it then because it was like, what the, ooh, I, how is that possible? How is that possible? Um, it was my responsibility to create a positive experience of that, to transcend that situation, to look at the fact that I was bothered by it and say, hmm, that's interesting. And to not fall into the trap of this false dichotomy where either they are wrong or or either they're right in what they're doing and or I have to suffer over it. Do you know what I'm saying? Either what they're doing is right or I have to suffer over it. Wait, is that, is that right what I'm saying? What I'm saying makes sense. If, if what they're doing is wrong, I have to suffer over it. Do you see what I'm saying? And looking at that whole thing and saying, boy, I'd like to be able to not be perturbed by this kind of thing happening. And I kind of went to work on that. And so when you begin to see this person's behavior as and this is this is kind of like getting in the spirit of play and it's engaging with every level of your life experience sometimes at the so if all you can do is interact at the social level you're going to encounter people who are belligerent who are rude who who are um, they are in a state of consciousness that causes them to behave in ways that are inexcusable. And if all you, if your emotional response is limited to what their behavior is, they're controlling you. Mm. And you know, you know what I'm saying? They're, they're, they're controlling you. I have no choice. My back is against the wall. I have to be enraged at your outrageous behavior. But if I have the ability to kind of transcend this, I see, okay, part of life is that there's kind of a meta propriety to impropriety part of reality is that people behave inappropriately sometimes that's part of it so in a sense it's appropriate that people behave inappropriately now that's not a reason to not report this person or whatever but it is a reason to find a way to respond resourcefully to it one of the biggest sources of stress in our life is when we tell ourselves this shouldn't be happening mm -hmm. there's a difference between that's not appropriate workplace behavior or I haven't done anything to deserve that and emotionally resisting the fact that an individual is in a state of consciousness that's causing them to treat you in some way you don't deserve to be treated. Does that make sense? Is that, is that distinction clear that I'm not saying, well, you know, live and let live and you just kind of take it and let them say things about you and you just, you just kind of deal with your bad feelings. It's not, it's not about that. It's about that's inappropriate. Now, how am I going to respond resourcefully to inappropriate behavior? Because if I'm great at responding resourcefully to appropriate behavior, but I fall apart when I encounter inappropriate behavior, I'm going to be doing a lot of falling apart. And I have the capacity to respond resourcefully to inappropriate behavior. And a big part of it is kind of, for me, it's been pondering a lot of the things that we've talked about here. Begin, yeah. Oh, I was going to say, just, it really does feel like a superpower when you, when you like, and you, you start to see these as opportunities instead of obstacles. You start to see this as like, you know, like when you actually do it, you know, there are rude people and people that have said things about me. And it's like, gosh, like my ability to transcend this is going to serve me like so much. <laughs> If I can see this, if I can, you know, see what someone has said about me or see how they're behaving towards me, whether, you know, like instead of trying to justify myself against the things saying, no, 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 you're seeing it wrong. You need to see me this way and trying to control. Remember, we've talked about this a lot, like the image that someone else has of you, you know, like they've got a statue of you on their property and they, you know, are throwing eggs at it that's their property. And like Sally said, like, you know, what, what they do with their property, what someone thinks about you, it's none of your business and your ability to, to really cleave yourself, to separate yourself, um, and how you feel like in your inmost chamber, um, from like the, the comments of the people in the rabble, you know, it's like you, it's so important that you have that inner sanctum and that there are levels of, 
um, filtering between the things that people say to you, the way that they treat you, you know, their behavior towards you and like how you feel in your core. And that's something that like I've been practicing a lot and I'm really just, just meditating on and journaling about are these, um, you know, like the disciplined mind, like the, like the disciples in the Bible, you know, you guys, we've been talking a lot about, um, you know, the psychological interpretation of the Bible. And one of those things is like the disciples, they're like qualities of mind. Their qualities, um, you know, when you have a disciplined mind, you have activated these disciples. Like the principle, I think it's Simon, is about hearing and like hearing only things basically that edify you, that fill you up, that make you feel good. And basically you fill, filter out things that are not aligned with your ideal. It's as though you truly do not hear them. And so you set up these guardians. Napoleon Hill talked about this too, of like these guardians of your mind. When information comes in, when you get feedback from your external environment, there are like people that it has to go through before it gets to that, that core center, that core center, that part of you that's able to have a conflict. <clears throat> if you've got these these defenses if you've got these disciples if you've got these guardians of your mind it's like they can't even get to that level where they can shake you to your core where you truly feel like fight or flight i'm in a corner i don't know what else, else to do and your body says i'll adapt and <laughs> change your tissues and you know you'll have to have healing symptoms later on you you get to the point where it doesn't even reach that level because you have so many um, mental tools and resources to go to and it is, and it is, it does take training. It does take like, okay, this, remembering who you are in those moments. And that's what it is, is like, you forget who you are. You forget that you are the all powerful queen of your universe who gets to assign meaning and decide what things mean and decide how they want to feel about things. Um, instead of just being reactionary and being reflexive in your responses, there's like, there's something that happens in between the, the feedback that comes in and the way that you feel about it. I think one of the big things about this too is is not taking it personally. One of my kind of favorite sort of play on words is um, take no shit personally and personally take no shit, which is to say this is that kind of like balancing that whole doormat thing. It's like I'm not going to take anything that you do personally. Um, on the other hand, I, I'm not going. There's this interesting kind of a mix though, where I mean, people sometimes will say what you're what you're saying isn't right. People are bullying. People are this. They should do something differently. My personal experience is that the people who create negative experiences of abuse or of harassment tend to be the ones who tolerate it because those negative experiences are exhausting and they're depleting and they take a lot out of you. And I mean, I can't respond to this person's mistreatment of me because I'm so obliterated by my negative experience of it. Nobody creates a positive experience of a jerk or of rudeness and then therefore attracts more rudeness into their life. Nothing about the state that I get myself in as a result of engineering a more resourceful experience of, of, of a rude person evokes from that person more rudeness. We have this idea that emotional resistance is somehow or another going to stamp out or prevent or quell whatever it is that we're resisting. And it tends to be exactly the opposite. We tend to, to the extent that we resist a thing and suffer over it, we tend to kind of perpetuate that thing in our lives. And so one of the, one of the big things that I was thinking about was one, think about her, she's just part of my reality. Her rudeness is just a part of my reality. My job is, is not to control my reality. My job is not to make what is other than what what is is at a given moment in time. My job is simply to respond resourcefully to it. If you feel boxed in, it's because you're telling yourself something should be other than it is when you can't directly change that thing and, and you're probably neglecting things that you could be changing. So you wanna just kind of generalize it there, depersonalize it. On the other hand, Look at her treatment of you. You're just a part of her reality. You understand that? So she's not mistreating you. She's not being rude to you. She's interacting unresourcefully, inelegantly, with her reality. And everything about the way she's responding to her reality, including the subset that happens to be you, is a result of the state of consciousness that she's in. You know, this is this, and you know, there's some trite sayings that, you know, what is it, how um, it says more about you than it does about me. But then you know, sometimes that turns into kind of like petty blame kind of tossing back and forth. But this is just a statement of fact that if I'm seeing you in a particular way, the manner in which I'm seeing you is a result of my state of consciousness. It's not a, it's not a product of anything that you are doing. And so when you begin to recognize that, you say, you know, oh, here's another useful principle. Everyone's always doing the best they can given the resources available to them at the time. She's being rude to you because that's the best that she can do given the resources that are available to her at the time. A little bit of maybe opportunity for compassion there. If you want to, if you're not ready, just don't worry about that. 
Also, though, we can say to ourselves, if it's true for her, it's true for me. Everyone's doing the best they can with the resources available to them at the time. I'm doing my best to create a positive experience of her, a compassionate experience of her, maybe an indifferent experience of her and her behavior um, than I can, given the resources that are available to me. And when I get more resources, I'll do a better job. And actually, the more resources I acquire, the better job I do, the less I suffer over the fact that she's not doing a better job than she is. Ooh, maybe it's all coming from me. Isn't that interesting? Oh, it's great when you recognize this stuff on the back end. What we want to do is we want to trick you into creating a little bit better positive experience, and then from that place of, ha, ah, you know, mm. then we say, oh, I'm responsible. If you're feeling like crap, we don't want to discuss responsibility. We want to, we want to get you high on responsibility and then talk about responsibility because it works so much better. It's, it's like instead of being Teflon, you're Velcro for it. You know what I mean? So you want to get yourself <laughs> in a state where you're receptive to these things. You want to get yourself into a state where you have enough sense to grab the sword by the hilt and not the, the blade. You know, is the hilt the blade? No. By the handle, not the blade. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot of people is that they, they grab these ideas by the blade and they cut themselves and they say, oh, that's not good. I don't like that. That didn't make me feel good. It's like, well, you know, you, you got to grab it by the right end. And a lot of that has to do with getting yourself in a, in a meeting yourself where you are and not meeting yourself where you're not because you won't. Um, so that's one of those, you know, kind of big things. Here's something um, that might be kind of more specific and practical about, okay, create a different experience. Well, how the hell do you do that? What are you telling yourself that this person's behavior means, right? To you, for you, and about you. What does it mean about her, does it mean that she's just a shit person and, a, and an awful individual? Does it, or, you know, what I'm saying? Does it mean that you've done something wrong? Do you have kind of a preset or a default meaning, kind of in your in your filter that you, when you filter stuff that comes in, that says, "What have I done wrong in light of what's coming in?" And when what's coming in is an angry coworker, you feel like you've done something wrong, even if you know you haven't. Oftentimes, there's this kind of disparity between what I know and what I feel. I know I haven't done something wrong, but I feel as though I have. And because I because I haven't rewired myself so that when I know I haven't done something wrong, I feel I haven't done something wrong. When she says I've done something wrong or acts as though I've done something wrong, I feel like I have. And then I blame her for some faulty wiring that exists within me. Is there some way that I could opt? And, and, and the thing too is it's not that it's wrong to blame her. It's that it's not resourceful. If I did that rewiring, one of my favorite quotes, I think we did this one in the last video we did. What would it take for me to not give an F about this? What would it take for me to not be bothered by this person's behavior? What what would it what would have to be true in order for her to be able to do what she's doing and me not to just take it like a punching bag, but to be so swift in my movements, kind of like judo, that I kind of just her out of the way. You know, it, it, when someone, to the extent that I feel the need to attack somebody or defend myself against a person or find fault with them or justify the negative feelings I'm having about them, it's usually directly proportionate to the extent to which I'm experientially vulnerable to them. You know, I'm I'm really ag aggrieved by your behavior because your behavior is experientially relevant to me. I haven't found a way to not be bothered by this, and therefore I am, and I blame you for the bother. You know what I mean? If I can find a way that's clever, not because I should, again, not because I'm obligated to, I don't really want to be reasonable. I want to improve what it's like to be me. I want to enjoy myself to an unreasonable degree in circumstances when it isn't reasonable to do so. And it's possible to do that, but I have to be willing to be unreasonable. I have to be willing to kind of pass up on grievances that are extremely low hanging and kind of scale the tree and find the really great fruit at the top, which is the kind of resourceful response fruit, you know, like the stuff that most people never do because most people just grab what's low hanging, which is I'm angry, I'm sad. I'm depressed. I'm offended. I'm uh, it's like, you know, but it's mealy and it's gross and it's not right. But the stuff at the top takes some climbing, but it's much more, you know, worthy of accessing. So yeah, telling yourself that she should be other than she is, that's, that's going to create this. I mean, observe your responses to her, not in a, in a condemning way. Don't beat yourself up for being upset. She's being a jerk. You know, most people would be upset. It's not about being a, I mean, see, telling yourself you should feel differently about how she is at a given moment in time isn't going to work any better than telling yourself she should be behaving differently than she is at a given moment in time. Everyone's doing the best they can, given the resources that are available. You get better. And the better you get, the better you better get. And so you just want to observe yourself and see what is your conflict what is your what is your experiential conflict about her behavior made of? What do you have to do? What do you what state do you have to be in? 
Notice differences. Are there sometimes when she acts this way and it doesn't really bother you and sometimes it does? Are there meanings that you're assigning? Are you telling yourself? Is there something that's almost pre-conscious that happens but before you know you even notice it and then you're immersed in the experiential consequences of it? Are you worried about what other are you worried that she's gonna contaminate other people with her unjust condemnation of you? Are you folk are you are you using her behavior as a cue to start focusing on what you do not want rather than focusing on what you do want? Are you finding fault in her? Are you allowing you know what she's doing to have I mean to derail your kind of resourceful focus you know I mean, that's one thing I would notice I'm using other people's unresourceful behavior as an excuse to behave unresourcefully this is an interesting thing I noticed this it's in like myself it. and I said oh I don't have to do that it's, it's weird I mean it's weird it's it's, it's 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 a weird way to live but most people spend a lot of time feeling ways they don't want to feel and I want to be a weird person who feels good all the time and people say doesn't that bother you aren't you upset about this no I just think I used to you know if only you knew um, and I think it is it's it's about that and being patient with yourself, but being engaged. It's that attention minus effort. It's go in to work on, I don't know if you're working tomorrow, but if you go on Monday, go in on Monday with a curious mind. I don't hope she's different than she is. I don't, I, you know, I don't hope I feel differently than I have in the past. I just want to watch and see. You know what I'm saying? With any luck, she'll still be in a crappy mood so that you can get an opportunity to observe what's going on here and see if you don't see things in a different way. And, and you're going to notice meanings probably that you did not know that you were assigning. This means I'm not respected. If I don't feel bad about her, that means I'm a doormat. If I don't stand up to her, that means that I am not getting the respect that I deserve. I am obligated to, you're not obligated to do that. You know, not fighting these battles. It, it, it's, it's the powerful people that don't engage with the weak forces. Do you know what I mean? If I have, if every time somebody walks down my street, I feel like I need to run out there and beat them up. Am I less powerful probably, less secure in my own power than if I can see someone going by and be like, you know, fine, whatever. Or, you know, like our dog, he likes to bluster at people and you can tell it gives him a sense of like, ah, yeah, I showed them, you know. Sometimes it takes um, a, a sense of, of, of solidity and security and your own self-concept and your own, that is again, can make that okayness. If I'm really solid in my self-concept and I'm fully identified with my ideal, somebody comes along and does something that would undermine that were I to allow it to, but it's like it, it, it's like a it's like a weak person that weighs fifteen pounds comes up and punches you as hard as they can. And it's sort of like, oh, was there something there? 15 Just, pounds. Yeah, fifteen pounds. 15. Yeah, actually, fifteen pounds. That's what, <laughs> I was, well, I was gonna say like fifty pounds, but I was like, no, that that it's, you know, there could be someone out there who's really small. This is little kids that weigh fifty pounds that could punch pretty hard. But yeah, it, it's almost like was that a little something that someone did? That's that that's the goal. That's what we're going for. Um, and interestingly and ironically, the, and this is one of those things. It's always true. The way for me to create a change in my present reality is to find a way to engineer a more resourceful experience of that reality. I'm not saying get get yourself full of confidence so that you can be a better punching bag. I'm saying get yourself to the point where figure out how to be unperturbed by this, genuinely unperturbed. Not, well, I, I towed the line and it was tough, but boy, I had a shitty day. I'm talking about the point where you're really truly not bothered by this anymore because you experience it so differently and the situation will change. You'll do things, other people will do things, reality will re literally, it remolds itself around your new experience. When that experience permeates every aspect of your consciousness, if it's the veneer, nothing's gonna change and the veneer will be rubbed away and you'll be back to the same old situation. If you do a full transformation of your experience though, it can, it, she can't, she can't keep doing the same thing. Things will change. And and this, it just make, it makes me come back to that concept that I love so much of anti-fragility, um, where not only do, you know, you, you're resilient and robust against the um, attacks from other people or the invitations, but you see them and you actually improve every time you notice the way that you're feeling in response to someone and you transform it and you transmute it. And and really what I've been doing lately is is seeing, oh gosh, like anytime I have just an uneasy feeling and not okay feeling or, you know, what could be the beginning or, you know, some type of conflict going on inside me, I I'm looking at it and it's like, gosh, why why am I giving this power? And it's and all it is is like it's me giving my power away to someone. And if I can recognize that and if I can identify it and if I I can 
make that shift, make that actual real shift deep now down, not to say, Oh, I'm okay. I, that's, that doesn't bother me. Or, you know, you can see your, you can't fool your body, your body knows. And that's why you can't, you know, just talk your way out of a conflict or just affirmation your way out of a conflict. It has to be a true shift in self concept, but that's the work. That's the only work we're interested in doing. <laughs> you know, we're not interested in doing any work that's just surface level, that just sounds good, that just like, you know, checks all the boxes on like the positive think it, it's not about that I like, want it to sound weird and work well that's yeah. my God. I don't want it to sound good yeah it's like you know you and that's you know a lot of people say oh well you can't you, you know you can't resolve conflicts just by you know changing your your thoughts or changing your you know it, it's got to be it, and that's the thing is like the stuff that we do and what we teach and resolve and you know what we do in our coaching what I do in my coaching it's about getting to that deep 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 down level it's about permeating all of the the surfaced ideas and that's the thing a lot of the people that i work with are brilliant people they're brilliant and they know so much and they could teach a personal growth seminar they could be a brilliant amazing coach for someone but it hasn't sunk down deep and so they see that they're still having conflicts and they're still having symptoms because it's not penetrated and permeated and done like the deep, deep, deep inner work. Um, and that's, I mean, it does, it requires, you know, that ruthless commitment to introspection, that ruthless commitment to like, have I shifted? And I have to do this too. We do this all day long. It's like, are you fully identified with your ideal? Are you there? Are you like unshakable, imperturbable, fully knowing that all is well in your world, everything is perfectly as it should be? Or are there still some like, mm, mm, this could be, you know? And if there's any of that, mm, like any of that wobbling, that's time to go into your workshop. And where's your workshop? Inside. <laughs> close your eyes, close the door to your senses. And it's like, getting real with that deep down part of yourself and your self-concept is truly, it's everything. Yeah. <laughs> everything flows from there. Everything in your life experience is flowing from who you are conceiving yourself to be 24 hours a day, all of the time. It's always a perfect reflection of your self-concept. And when you start seeing that and you really start getting that, I mean, it's a big concept to mm -hmm. grasp the whole idea of your self-concept creating everything. But once you do, it truly is transformative and you start seeing where the work needs to be done and where you, the the transformation has to take place. Yeah, it's so what you mentioned too about like the, you know a lot about personal growth but it hasn't really fully sunk in yet. It's kind of like veneers. Like, you know, if you you if you if just keep piling on more and more and more veneers, you're just gonna kind of like go further and further out. There's no there's no core change there. There's no alteration. I mean, it's one of the things I think that's kind of, it's kind of our specialty because I think, and it, it, it's not, I mean, as far as I can tell, it's because we just are and willing to settle for a less than wonderful experience. It's a selfish, it's a very selfish thing. It's that we, we actually want the promise of all the things that we talk about. It's not enough to talk about it. We want a deep integration. And once it's, you know, that deeply integrated, we can just use that to plow down some more. Um, and I think just kind of a list of, of, we'll run through some power principles. And these are probably things that we're going to cover next month, right? In Resolve. So if you like the sound of these things and you're not there, you should get there because we're going to do this times probably five or 10 in terms of the depth. Um, very powerful principles. I'm just going to rattle them off as they come to mind. Everything about what it's like to be me is coming from me. Yeah. Okay. I'm 100% responsible for my experience of you. Everybody's always doing the best they can given the resources that are available to them at the time. Everything makes sense when you view that thing in the full context in which it's occurring. Now, the core thing here, the key thing is that you apply this not just to what they are doing or what reality is doing, but you apply it also to your experience of reality and to your responses to it. It's not enough to say, oh, they were a jerk. Well, it makes sense that they were being a jerk given their bad childhood. Well, you're going to say, well, F them. They still shouldn't be mistreating me. I shouldn't have to deal with their bad childhood. You know? But it also involves the experience of their rudeness that I am creating. The fact that I'm not responding more resourcefully than I am makes sense when you view it in the full context in which it's occurring. What does that mean? The things to which I have access, the things to which I do not have access, the things that I could easily do if only they would occur to me. The, you know what I'm saying? All these different things. If I had more mental flexibility, if I had more power beliefs, if I had access, experiential access to notions, ideas, concepts, principles, and if I had a better ability to apply them to specific situations, I would be creating a better experience of this. Bottom line, if I had something better to think about, I would be. Whose responsibility is it to make sure I've always got something better to think about? Me. Whose responsibility is it to make sure I'm always in such a wonderful state that I don't have time 
for anything that erodes that state. Me, no one else can do that for me. And she, ah, it's, it, that's a me thing. I see, I see it, and it's a me thing. I believe it, and it's a me thing. And the core thing here too, and this is this is absolutely essential. I have to see it and experience it as true. This is the self persuasion. I am self persuaded. We don't just veneer these things. We actually we don't coerce ourselves to pretend like we believe them. We actually convince ourselves that they are true. And then from there, I see that this is my responsibility. And because I've practiced these other principles and these other skill sets and I work on my awareness, I so immediately see the positive implications that that responsibility has for my ability to improve what it's like to be me moving forward. I don't have time to feel guilty. I don't have time to feel bad. I don't have time to blame myself for have not done better than I did because as soon as I recognize something I could have done differently, there's a part in my brain that just has like a, a, a shortcut to what I can do now. What I can do now. It's one of the things actually that I've posted today is that a disciplined mind does not allow what is or what could have been to get in the way of, to cloud, to obscure, to impede, to get in the way of what can be. The fact that I could have had a better day today, if I sit around and stew and pout about that and beat myself up about it, I'm going to end, I'm going to fail to, what can be, create a wonderful day tomorrow or to create a wonderful evening right now. There's just this capacity for just resourceful response. And so when this person is a jerk, or when reality is a jerk and you reach for a resourceful response and there's not one there, it's not because it doesn't exist. It's because you haven't yet familiarized yourself with the toolbox. It's like one of those, you know, those great big toolboxes, you know, like the one in Home Alone that the kid pushes down the stairs and it's like the big, like, it's like, it was like a chest of drawers of tools. If you were to put me in front of one of those things and say, Steve, get out the ratchet, whatever. First of all, I don't even see, I don't even know, is, is ratchet just a complete description? I don't even, you know, anything. I wouldn't know what drawer to go to. If I needed it in a hurry, if my life depended on it, if the ship was going to sink or the car was going to explode, <laughs> I, the chances of me finding the drawer would be, would be minuscule, right? And it's not because the ratchet's not there. Everything that's going on in your life right now, every jerk, you know what I'm saying? Every piece of crap who's mistreating you, every situation that's oppressing you, everything that seems to be attesting to your inability to create the things that you want in life, there are resourceful responses, mental, emotional, physical, behavioral responses to every single one of those things. And if you keep reaching and they're not there, it's not because they don't exist. It's because you haven't found them yet. And one of the things that we do is that we give you a bunch of them and we organize them in a way that's really great. It's like a craftsman toolbox where it's like, oh, look at it. You know, you go here and here's the this. And you just sit around waiting for shit to break so that you can use one of your tools. You you sit around waiting for reality to challenge you so that you can respond resourcefully to it. It's kind of like, watch this, you know, watch this. It's one of those things like in, I, I did like Taekwondo when I was little because I was a kid in the 90s and everyone did this. And one of the things was that like occasionally the teacher would come around and he'd just be doing his normal stuff and blah, 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 and this is this and stand up straight. And then all of a sudden he wouldn't punch you hard, but he'd punch you hard enough to get your attention. And it was to train you to get to the point where uh, you could respond to a blow that you weren't expecting. And he was adamant about this because he said, if the only time you know how to block something is when I say, okay, here comes a punch, Steve. It's like the guy on the street that attacks, this is like seven year old Steve, the guy on the street who attacks you, and actually the school that I went to, I did get attacked on a number of occasions in elementary school. Um, it was kind of like rough and it's kind of like, we'll talk about that. I was like a street kid. Um, when you, not really, but I did get in some fights. Um, when, when, when you learn how to respond like that to these things, it's priceless. When your default response, when you recalibrate those things, it's wonderful. And you know what? When I got good at, at blocking Master Summer's punches, I was like, boy, I hope he's going to, he's, he's getting close to me. Is he going to try to punch me today? I wanted it to happen. And then he, you know, he, he punched Timmy. I'd be like, damn it. Damn it. Be great. <laughs> you know? And that's that thing is that you, you, you just wait for it. And life becomes fun. And it becomes about creating things that you want. But you really you just begin to see it as a project rather than a problem. And that's, that experience is just is terrific. It really, really is. And that, that's such a great example for the difference between like predictable stresses and a conflict shock. A conflict shock is something that catches you off guard that most people wouldn't be prepared for. You know, it's the punch from the instructor when you're like brand new to the class and you're like, I didn't even know that this was a thing that could even possibly happen. And those are the things that tend to, you know, trigger the most intense conflicts and, you know, you don't even know how to deal with them. And that's where like things that are predictable, they actually, they don't, trigger biological programs because they're predictable you you know they, it stresses you out and you don't like it but um a lot of times it's not until you're caught off guard that the actual biological program is initiated because that's when you feel like you know backed into a corner and so this ability you know getting really just practiced and agile and your ability to access these tools is so important and it really does help so much to improve everything about your experience um 
I mean, everything, <laughs> your relationships, you know, your relationship to yourself, most importantly. But I'm going to put in the link because a lot of the things that you mentioned, I'm like, oh, that's from the Power Belief uh, mm -hmm. email. We have this, um, we have a course, it's called Beyond Belief, which is really, really incredible. If you are trying to um, adopt new beliefs and you're like, how does one even go about adopting new beliefs? Because I've believed all this stuff for so long, there's a momentum behind it. Um, and Steve created this really phenomenal course like a very practical um, approach to you know introducing new beliefs and getting them to stick so you, it's not just surface level that it actually sticks to the core of you and it truly becomes your new belief um, all sorts of really awesome exercises in there and uh, we have 10 power belief it's like a thing that you can download like you can make your background on your phone um, and so I'll put the link in there because those are just free you can just put your email in and you'll get those 10 power beliefs which are really really awesome really just to ponder to start to think about do I believe that how much do I believe that would I like to believe that more and just putting it on your psychic radar is really a powerful way to start believing something that you wished you believed but you don't currently believe so We'll wrap it up there. Have a great night, guys. Thank you for being here with us. If you like the video, share it for someone else um, that it might help them. And we'll see you again yeah. soon. Bye. Good night.